have loved handheld game systems as long as I can remember, but somehow these retro emulator handhelds are something I've only just begun to get into. I've spent a lot of time covering the Amronic RG35XX, and that has led me to another device. This is the Pow Kitty RGB20S, and this video will be my review of that handheld. Let's start things off by going around the hardware of the device. So we have a 3.5 inch IPS display that runs at 640 by 480 resolution. It is powered by a rather old RK3326 processor running to 1.5 gigahertz. It is a quad core processor, but again, it is quite old. It does also have one gigabyte of RAM and a 3500 milliamp hour battery. If we go around physically speaking, we do have two analog sticks, which is nice to see ABXY face buttons start select a function key which doesn't really do much at least not in the operating system that i'm running maybe there's more to it than that we'll talk about that in a little bit as well as a d-pad on the back side you have four shoulder buttons l2 r2 l1 r1 i don't know why i said them in that order but there you go and if you look closely you can see the l2 and r2 buttons are ever so slightly taller than the L1 and R1, which makes them a little bit easier to kind of get a hold of, a little bit easier to, to press without pressing those buttons. And honestly, ergonomically, it works better than I expected it to. On this side, you have an SD card for your operating system as well as a volume rocker. On this side, an SD card that by default is going to contain your games, a reset button, and a power button. On the bottom, we have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, power in, and a OTG port for accessories and peripherals. Overall, I do think that the thing feels pretty decent in the hand. There is a little bit of rattle to it. If you shake the thing, you can hear some of the components and they're kind of shaking around, but that's true of a lot of these uh, handheld consoles from what I can tell. I did forget to mention a uh, speaker right there in the middle that does actually sound better than I expected. Overall, the hardware I think is pretty decent. A lot of people looked at this and said, that the layout is going to be really uncomfortable. To me, it's similar in comparison to this Steam Deck where I thought it was going to be very uncomfortable, but in uh, practically speaking, it really isn't that bad. You kind of get used to it and it's okay. It's not the best layout in the world, but you can get by with it. Now, before we get into a whole bunch of different game tests, I do want to make one thing very clear, and I've already talked about this in a prior video. When I first got this device within just a few hours of having it, trying to put some games on the SD cards they included, my device effectively bricked itself. My SD cards that were included began corrupting, and I wound up having to replace the SD card, flash the operating system. There's a whole video on the process for fixing that that should be in this very same playlist. So, by default, by you know, when you get this thing in the mail, it's going to be running a somewhat customized version of Arc OS. At least that's my understanding with this device. I barely got to touch the thing. What I'm going to be using is a more stock build of Arc OS. So some things may look different for you than they do for me because my device bricked itself, and this is how I was able to save it to test it from there. The features should be pretty much the same though. But if you see any weird little differences, that might be why. Really quickly, let's take a look at the interface and more or less how this thing works. So you have just a vertical scrolling list of emulators based on the ROMs it has found on your card. You can also favorite them, which is quite nice. You can hit uh, select, I believe, to what is select. Oh, select is the screensaver. It just turns off the screen. Start is the one that brings you into a list of settings that you can do different things in. Let's just pick a game here. And you can also hit start on that game and change specific settings to that game. If we load into the game, select is basically going to be your function key. Now, I presume there's a way to remap this so that your function key actually does something. But for right now, out of the box, it is select. So I'm, I'm assuming this is the same on the stock OS but it's something like this. Hold select and X will open up your retro arch menu where you can change all sorts of settings, save states, basically do a lot of things that if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna end up breaking things and it's gonna be a bad idea. At the same time though, you can hold down select just when you're in a game, not at the same time, just whenever. You can hold down select and hit R1 to do a save state, select an L1 to load that save state as well. Select an A will pause the emulation. We'll load into a save state here so you can see how that works. Load it in, boom. Uh, start and select at the same time twice will close the game. Now there are some emulators you'll see in the gameplay where those controls are not the same. You have to do something different with them. We'll see that here in just a second. Let's jump into some gameplay now. 
So we're gonna start off in this with Super Nintendo. This is Mega Man, obviously, and you know I could do some older systems, some arcade systems, some systems older than Super Nintendo, but I feel like if it runs Super Nintendo, it's gonna run all of those as well. And of course, it runs Super Nintendo just fine. I can not use the performance of this as an excuse for why I am so bad at Mega Man. This is a game I played when I was a kid, and I don't know how, but I was okay at it back then. I'm terrible at it now. Games have, I don't know what exactly about my skills have deteriorated to the degree that they have, but man, this game was shockingly hard going back and trying to play this. I was doing so incredibly poorly. But at the end of the day, Super Nintendo running just fine when it comes to Mega Man. We'll jump into another Super Nintendo game that I do actually really still enjoy, and that is Super Mario Kart. This game was so far ahead of its time, basically simulating full 3D rendering on the Super Nintendo. And as you can see here, it runs buttery smooth. Now, you may have been able to tell there from that audio that, one, the speaker actually sounds okay, but two, in N64 games, I was seeing a lot of, like, sort of crackling and so forth, a lot of stuttering with the performance. You can see here lots of little hitches and stutters. N64 not running supremely well. Perhaps there are some settings that could be dug into to make some of these things better, but some of these games just don't run all that well. This is Perfect Dark, which is a game that runs a bit better than I was expecting, actually, but of course the controls have not aged very well at all. I played this game so very much when I was a kid, and now I was finding it almost impossible to play, to control, and to look around, because back then, the N64, we really only had one joystick, so it was very difficult uh, to, to control these games, in particular now they're all used to dual stick gaming. But again, N64, just not running all that well. Some of these games are going to be playable, in particular slower games, RPGs, things like that are going to be more playable, but action games, you might have some issues, some stutters here and there. Please ignore what I'm doing here. Um, I don't know what came over me, although this woman's ability to predict the future and dodge unbelievable, uncanny abilities. Now this is a bit of a mixed bag for me because you can see there's a lot of texture sort of popping in and out and you can change the emulator core that it runs on and get rid of the popping textures, but then the frame rate dropped. So it's kind of hard to get this to run absolutely perfectly. But if you could ignore some of those weird glitches from time to time, I was actually very impressed with how well Super Mario 64 actually was running. As you saw just a moment ago, I was able to pull off some nice little maneuvers here that honestly, you know, if you look how bad these controls are supposed to be, you might be surprised I was able to do. So now we're moving on to Game Boy Advance, which pretty much any Game Boy Advance game is gonna run absolutely perfectly. That was a Pokemon ROM hack. Now we're looking at Metroid Fusion. Again, Game Boy Advance is going to be totally playable. Any game you want to play is going to be just fine on this thing. You can see a quick glimpse of myself there, how I was uh, struggling to play these games while peeking from around my S23 Ultra, which was acting as my camera for this, the acts of love that we commit for our YouTube channels. Again, GBA, lots of fun. So now we're jumping into Mario Kart on, yes, the Nintendo DS. This is a really cool one because you may be wondering, how on earth do you do Nintendo DS games on a single screen console? Well, L2 toggles between one screen and two screens being visible. R2 toggles between what screen is full screen. So that's one of the screens, that's the other. I can toggle back and forth between them, and then I can use the right stick to move a little emulated touch point on the screen. And look how well this performs. Mario Kart running fully, what, what am I trying to say? Running at totally full speed here, totally playable and a lot of fun. I could absolutely get down on some Mario Kart DS on this thing. I played a lot of Mario Kart DS back in the day. Some of these muscle memory things started coming back. Even with the ink in my face, guys, I still remember where those turns were. Too many hours spent playing this game. Another DS game, though, worth checking out that I thought was pretty cool was Super Mario 64 on the DS because, strangely enough, it might actually run better and look better 
than the original N64 version. And of course, you get all these extra characters like Yoshi and Wario, Luigi, and all these sorts of things. This is really cool. And again, works much better than I could have ever expected. So you can probably see there at the end that that menu that pulled up was different from the other emulators because Drastic is the emulator for Nintendo DS. And yes, it is one of the ones that are different. Rather than holding select and hitting X, you're going to click on L3 to open up that menu and do what you need to do there. So now we're jumping into PlayStation 1, and this is the original Spyro the Dragon running at full speed, looking pretty much exactly like I remember it looking. When I was a kid, it's always like surprising to me when PlayStation games run better on emulators. You think you would think in my mind anyways that PlayStation should be harder to render because it was just a better looking console a lot of the time. But it seems like that's never the case. PlayStation apparently is just easier to emulate. And we see more of that with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 again running at full speed and looking quite nice. If you want to run PlayStation games on this thing, all of the ones I tested are running quite well very very playable of course you know i've not played thps2 in a long time so it takes me a little while to kind of remember how to play these games as i am testing them but you could absolutely play this thing to your heart's content jumping now into resident evil 1 a game that like a lot of these retro games controls absolutely horrifically nowadays from you know what we're used to now with proper dual stick control as you jump into these old games and you're like oh my lord how did we ever play these things but again this is running exactly as it was before this scene here i remember seeing when i was a child and it just being absolutely horrified terrified all of those sorts of adjectives so if you want to play these sorts of playstation games on this uh, little handheld i think you're going to be absolutely fine to do that so we've now reached the point where we run up against this thing's capabilities, okay? This is a PlayStation Portable game, and it is absolutely not playable. This is a God of War. This might be Chains of Olympus, if I'm remembering correctly. Another emulator where you have different controls, which is R3 in this instance, to get into your emulator controls. If you try running some, like, lower-end, more basic PSP games, like Loco Roco, you're going to be able to play those, but high-end, fully 3D PSP games are just off-limits. Dreamcast games are just not going to run either. Pretty much anything above PlayStation, probably not something you're going to have much of a good time with. So let's take a second here and look at the listing for this device. It can be had for $89.99. It does come with these stickers you can put on it and have a little animal face on there if you want to have that for whatever reason. I've opted not to do that, but it's there as an option in the box. What do I think of this thing for $89.99? Well, considering you're getting pretty much everything from PlayStation down, all of that stuff is going to be anywhere between perfectly playable, like perfect emulation to quite playable. I think for $90, it is a pretty decent purchase. Now, my biggest problem with it is that just like with my Ambernic device, I ended up having to replace the SD card and do something weird with the operating system. I cannot tell you that this thing, when you buy it, you're going to be able to purchase it and just use it and never have to do any tinkering with it because I had to immediately tinker with it. Now, perhaps if you never take the SD cards out and you just play the games it came with, of which there are thousands, perhaps, you may be totally okay. Just leave the SD cards in there if you don't want to have to do any of the crazy stuff that I had to do to get mine working again. I have to say that the Ambernic device still does kind of hold a special place in my heart. I don't know what it is about it, but I, I do in ways still prefer this thing. Even though this one can do more, it can play more games, I don't know. I, I, I kind of still want to reach for the Ambernic for reasons that I don't fully understand. They are of extremely similar size and in a lot of ways extremely similar design. So I don't know what to make of that. Just take that for what it's worth, I guess. I should also mention that this Ambernic device is about $30 less expensive. You lose the sticks and you lose N64 and the potential for trying things like PSP, which may or may not work. So factor that in in your purchasing decision. Overall, I actually really do like this thing a lot. I think it's capable of doing a whole heck of a lot. It does things better than I expected. I, the fact that you can even attempt to run a PSP game on it is kind of silly, but hey, 
Loco Roco, maybe Patapon or something like that. You may be able to play those games to a satisfactory level, PlayStation games, and even games like Ocarina of Time. If you can put up with some jitteriness here and there, you could probably play those games relatively well. And that is pretty darn cool. Guys, I got to give a shout out to MechDIY for sending this device over for me to review. As always, they are seeing my review at the exact same time as you are. There are links in the description to purchase this device. The Amazon links are an affiliate link that will help support this very channel that you are watching. Guys, thanks for watching. I will see you on the next one. And until next time, stay nerdy.